really awesome that Noria came down. Uh, she got her PhD from MIT Media Lab, uh, working on all sorts of intersection of learning and UI and UX problems. And then she was at MSR, uh, the most awesome research lab in the world, of course, uh, for about seven years. But then she decided to, she wants to go back home. And now she is running uh, all of uh, R&D related to data mining and user modeling and telephonic research. Uh, she'll tell us today about mobile data, how it's big, awesome, and learning. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Is this on? Yeah. Well, thank you first, the organizers, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I just wanted to give a warning in case the talk is not what you expect. I, I was going to say, uh, before, so like before I start, in case any of you, uh, you know, thinks this is not what they're interested in. So I'm going to give an overview on the uh, range of projects that we are working on that uh, deal with large-scale data. But I'm not going to go into the detail, any technical detail on any of the projects, because I only have 40 minutes. Um, of course, I'm more than happy to give you the details or send you the papers after the talk, but the purpose of this talk is mainly to sort of like entice you with all the sort of like interesting problems that we are working on and also um, show how, you know, machine learning and data mining algorithms have a lot of applications kind of like in the real world. And this is joint work with um, another team in addition to my team and then uh, uh, a group of the researchers uh, of my team and uh, PhD intern students, a lot of PhD intern students that we have in the summer. This is the overview of the talk. Uh, first, I will just say a couple of words about Telefonica because uh, even myself, who uh, I am originally from Spain, when I decided to move back here, I didn't know much about Telefonica and why should I go to Telefonica coming from MSR. So I just gave a little bit of an overview of the company. And then I'll talk about what kind of data we have and, and why, um, you know, if we have big data and the nature of this data. And then I'll just present some exemplary projects uh, that we do with this data, from social network analysis to characterizing the mobility of people, uh, predicting the socioeconomic levels, or inferring the personality of people. And then I'll just have some conclusions. So Telefonica. Um, ha have you heard of Telefonica? Maybe some of you. I mean, if you are here in Granada for a week, you probably have interacted with, me with Telefonica already. Uh, it's actually the largest uh, integrated telecommunications company in the world. It's, uh, it's huge. It operates in uh, 23 countries, in Europe, in Latin America, and it also operates in China because it owns 10% of China Unicom. And it has about 300 million customers worldwide and about almost 300,000 employees. So it's a really, really big company, and that I didn't know when I went. Uh, as I mentioned, it operates in, in Europe in different countries, uh, Spain, UK, Germany, Ireland, Czech Republic, and Slovakia. In Latin America, it is pretty much almost in every country in Latin America, except for there. Uh, and it also has a very big backbone and international network. It actually handles about 10% of the internet traffic in the world. Uh, and it has a tier one uh, IP backbone that connects the entire uh, planet. Then within Telefonica, there is Telefonica R&D, which is the R&D branch of Telefonica. Um, and it is a very large R&D company as well. It is located uh, in Spain, uh, in Brazil, and uh, we have a center also in Israel uh, because Telefonica acquired a voice over IP company called Jaja recently. We are about 1,200 people, uh, mainly um, developers, software developers, and a small group of uh, researchers. But we also have uh, designers, psychologists. It's a fairly multidisciplinary uh, company. And we collaborate a lot. We have a lot of open innovation, and we do a lot of uh, collaborations, both with universities, research centers, and also other companies. Uh, if any of you is in academia and you have PhD students, we have an internship program. Uh, in Barcelona and in Madrid, so if you are interested, you can talk to me later. So within Telefonica R&D, we have the research branch, which is where I am. And we have two locations, uh, Madrid and Barcelona, but the headquarters are in Barcelona. This is our building. It's a really fancy, brand new building uh, by the ocean. Uh, so very attractive location. And these are the areas that we are working on. We are working on mobile computing, human computer interaction, user modeling, and uh, we have a subsection working specifically on recommender systems, data analysis, multimedia data analysis, complex systems, and networking, both fixed networks and wireless networks. And I'm sort of like responsible for the top uh, areas that I mentioned. 
This is just some pictures of like the different um, people from the lab. We have all nationalities. We speak in English. We don't speak in Spanish or in Catalan. It's very international. And I'll just move on into like the actual talk. So big data. So what kind of data do we have if we are a telecommunications company? So before I go into the details of the data, something that I think uh, probably many of you are aware of, but there is, is definitely there's a lot of discussion about this, both in the World Economic Forum and in industry, is the fact that data is the new currency. And data is really pre pretty much the most valuable asset that many companies have today, mainly internet companies. You know, that's what, what makes Facebook valuable, or Twitter, or Google, or Telefonica. And there is still questions about how we can monetize this data be besides advertisement, which is sort of like, um, you know, the mainstream, sort of like most typical way, uh, while taking also into account the privacy of the users. Because a lot of this data is uh, user behavioral data. So what kind of data do we have? Um, we have a lot of customer provided data. So we have the names of people when, when they have a contract with Telefonica. Uh, we have all the preferences if they opt in, all the contact data, you know, their, their home addresses so we can build them. Um, Telefonica bought about a year ago a social network company called 20, which is the most popular social network in Spain for the younger bracket of the population. They have about 90 plus percent of the market share. Um, so we have a lot of the data from the profiles of the social network. Uh, we also do surveys, and through the surveys, you know, people answer, and, and we get um, this kind of data. We also have a lot of sensed data. Um, we can sense the connectivity status, the type of terminal people have, the location of people, a lot of network data. Telefonica also has a TV, uh, uh, sort of like um, cable TV service. Uh, so we have the viewing patterns of TV of people. Um, they also have an online portal called Terra, so you, you can have all the online interactions. Uh, and then we have CDRs, which is what we have been playing the most with, uh, which I'll explain later what they are if you don't know what they are. And then we also infer additional attributes about people from all this data. Um, a very important concern in any company is the churn rate, which means the rate with which people leave you and they go to a, a competitor. Uh, we try to identify who are the alpha users. We try to characterize the mobility of people, um, the socioeconomic status, and then the behavioral age, which is what really matters. So here they tell us their age, but what really defines people is not their chronological age, but their behavioral age. And this you can only uh, infer from the actual behavior. Uh, and then their personality, which is one of the latest projects that we have done. So what are CDRs, which is the main data set that we have been uh, dealing with uh, in the past couple of years. So this the CDR means call detail record. And it is a record that is generated every time a mobile phone makes or receives a phone call or sends or receives an SMS or an MMS. And every time this happens, um, there is an entry. And the entry has the calling party, the, the, the number of the caller, the number of the colleague, the location of the base station that the person is connected to, the timestamp on when the call started, the duration of the call, the result of the call, if it was successful or not, or if it ended, and then the type, if it's an SMS or if it's voice. So we have these records for all these countries, and uh, the question is, what can we do uh, you know, with all this data? But before I go into that, the, I think uh, an interesting question is to say, well, uh, how much is this really? Um, because you're probably familiar with uh, query logs from Yahoo or Google, but maybe you're not familiar with the, si with the CDRs, the size of these CDRs. This is just uh, so you understand a little bit how the mobile network is set up, which I assume you all know. So there is a number of cellular towers all over a certain geography, and each cell tower is responsible for a certain area. And the way we typically do the modeling is we do some uh, Voronoi tessellation of the physical space, and then we assign um, uh, all this area to each of the sort of like towers uh, in the center of the cell. And this is an example of how some of the entries of the uh, CDRs look like. In all, uh, in, in um, yeah, this is uh, for example an example of the tessellation of Madrid, of the city of Madrid. So you get a sense of the density. Uh, this is like a block of uh, of houses. The density of towers uh, in the downtown of cities is very dense. In rural areas, it's less less dense, obviously. So just to give you an idea of the amount of data, we have a lot of data. Just to put it in, uh, in perspective, 
the daily CDRs only for UK are about 1.1 billion, and the daily page views uh, for eBay worldwide is 1 billion, and the daily searches for Google worldwide are 2.9 billion, and this is only for one country. So if you multiply by 23 countries, we get a lot. Um, the custom, for example, the aggregated data for our customer data in the data warehouse uh, is in the orders of hundreds of terabytes or, or larger. Um, the network data is the largest um, data, sort of like source of data that we have, and in fact, it's so large that it cannot even be stored because it, it, we wouldn't have the capacity to store it. So there's uh, 74 terabytes a day that are being generated with network information, for example, and as I mentioned, in the UK, there's 1.1 billion of daily CDRs, and in Spain, there is 4 billion of daily uh, CDRs that are being generated. So as you all know, um, the fact that we have all this data doesn't really mean much because, you know, how do you interpret the data and how do you handle this data? And there's a lot of challenges with doing all this uh, big data stuff. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is that uh, all these data sets are in different countries and in different uh, databases. Uh, even for the different services, it, they are in different databases. So it's very difficult to have a unified view of the same customer, you know, the, can the TV that they watch and where they are and so forth because all these data sets are in, in very different, um, physically located in different places and also um, um, using different protocols and different uh, sort of like architectures for the databases. So the collection is very challenging. Um, of course, the processing is also very challenging, and we have uh, big data architectures that I'm not going to go into the detail. We use uh, distributed computing, we use Hadoop, uh, etc. Uh, we are working on scalable uh, machine learning algorithms, like was the tutorial from Yahoo uh, before. And of course, there is very big privacy issues, um, and we are extremely careful with this uh, because it's a very sort of like sensitive topic. In terms of the problems that we are trying to solve, a lot of the problems are related to better understanding our customers. And this is what is called uh, business intelligence. So we, uh, the goal uh, would be to have a very good idea of who our customers are, what do they like doing, what they don't like doing, who their friends are, so the company can provide services that are meaningful for these people and, and can improve the quality of life of these people. Um, we want to increase customer satisfaction. As I mentioned, we want to reduce the people that leave the company and go to another company, maybe because they are not happy with the service of the company. And then, of course, the marketing teams are very interested in doing targeted advertisement and, and having more successful marketing campaigns than if you don't know, you know who, who your customers are and, and what do they like. In terms of the network, there is also a lot of applications uh, to be able to put the resources in the right place. Depending on the behavior of people in certain places, you might need to um, allocate more resources um, uh, and so forth. Predict, for example, uh, traffic in the network to prevent uh, blackouts, uh, etc. And then we're also working on some new applications. There is an emergent area uh, called Smart Cities, which I don't know if you have heard of, but almost every city now in the world is a smart city. Uh, and uh, the idea is to see how this pervasive data analyzed in an aggregated fashion, not in an individual fashion, but in an aggregated fashion, can help urban planners uh, better model the behavior of the city to provide better services in the city or to decide, you know, when they decide where to put a park or where to put a public transport line, um, they use this real data uh, to be able to make those decisions. There is obviously a lot of mobile location-based services that you can design if you have a very good understanding of, uh, how, of people and what people need and how people move. And then we're also working on contextual recommendations. So now I'm just going to give a quick overview of some of these um, areas or problems that we are working on. And the first one is social network analysis. And this is a very big area in itself. And there will be like many talks that you know, we could just give only on that. Uh, so I'll just give some little, like, you know, snapshots of the projects. Um, the one, so like the, fo the first focus on the social network analysis work is to understand how each customer is being influenced by its social network and is also influencing their social network. So traditional models that didn't, that didn't use the social network information, for example, for churn, they were just characterizing the behavior of one individual. But what we are doing is saying, well, people don't live isolated. They, they interact with other people, and those people have an, an influence on them. So can we build models that not only depend on the behavior of the individual, but also on the influence that the social network is having uh, on these people? 
So before I go into um, more details, uh, what I, I just wanted to present with a couple of slides um, an explanation on how we reconstruct a social network from the call detail records. Because as opposed to social networking companies where people uh, declare certain um, people as their friends, we don't have that explicit um, declaration. All we have is the phone calls that people make through a certain time period. And from there, we need to infer the social network. Uh, so there are a number of criteria that you can use, you know, the total number of um, uh, bi-directional phone calls between two people, the number of SMSs that they interchange, uh, the number of MMS, MMS uh, that they interchange, etc. the total accumulated length of the uh, time that they have spent talking to each other. Uh, but those are um, somewhat heuristics, and in the social networks community, there is a, a lot of research that, that is being done on uh, defining a link between two nodes in the network. This is a still an open research project that is not, it doesn't have a clear answer. Um, before I go into the, the definition of the, of the uh, link between two edges, another problem is the dynamics of the social network. So the way we typically build a social network is that we take a snapshots of the network, say one snapshot every month. We look at all the uh, phone calls that have happened during that month, we build the social network, and then we try to uh, integrate the information from different snapshots into one global snapshot that summarizes um, the, the, so the social networks from each of the snapshots. And in order to do that, we need to take into account the dynamics of the, um, of the communication. So if there, if there is a link here, but that link doesn't appear here, then we add a decaying weight into that link. Uh, we need to be able to characterize temporary connections versus more permanent connections, uh, etc. So to better um, characterize the links, uh, we have a PhD student who is doing her PhD uh, exactly on, on this. And we have uh, created a new um, quantity uh, called transmissibility, um, which is uh, instead of assigning as a weight in the social network between two nodes the total number of phone calls between them or the duration of the phone calls, we assign to the node this new um, quantity that we have uh, defined called the transmissibility. And what the transmissibility represents is the probability that a certain piece of information is going to be transmitted from node I to node J in the network. And the nice properties that it has is that it's able to characterize bursty behavior. So some of the latest uh, um, findings in the social network community, uh, particularly in Laszlo Varavasi's team, as you have heard of him, um, is the fact that human behavior is bursty. And this has been found in different contexts, not only in phone calls, but in email and in other types of behavior. So people don't interact with each other at homogeneous uh, sort of like rates, but they interact a lot during, during a certain time period, and then they don't interact, and then they, they, they interact a lot. And we do the same when we work. We work a lot on something, and then we don't work on it, and then we work again. So this, this is called bursty behavior. So the transmissibility is able to characterize behavior that is bursty. It's able to characterize also correlations between uh, incoming and outgoing events, so conversations that might be happening within a group, and also the appearance and disappearance of links, which is one of the challenges uh, when you create a social network, to be able to have the links disappear and new links appear. So uh, if you are interested in, in this particular topic, I can point you to the papers on this. Another uh, problem that we're working on is in identifying communities within the social network, where a community is basically a subgraph within the overall graph of uh, people that are regularly interacting with each other. And uh, of course, you can have strong or weak ties, and there's a lot of uh, parameters and, and uh, tweaking that you can do, but sort of like that's the basic uh, idea. Uh, something important is that the algorithms that we develop for identifying these subgraphs within the large graph uh, cannot be uh, exclusive. So we allow uh, individuals to belong to multiple communities because they could be the work community versus the uh, family community versus the friends community, uh, etc. This is just an illustration of, of how the sort of like communities work. So we have this network here. There will be these two communities here. And then this will be, this will be the resulting um, graphs that represent each of the communities if you take into account you know, the nodes and then the links between them. So why do we care about communities? Um, one of the reasons why we care about communities is because uh, churn has a social uh, component. Uh, and 
uh, what we have found in our, in our work is that about 15% of the people that churn, people that live, uh, in this case, Telefonica, have a previous turner, a, per, a previous person that, that left the company in their community. And this can go all the way to 23%. So that's a fairly uh, big uh, percentage of the, or a big influence that the community has. So we observe in a community that a person is living, we can infer the probability that the other people in that community have to be living. Um, as I mentioned, this is what we can do, identify the people. Uh, and then also, um, we use two metrics to characterize the influence that a certain person um, has on the community, which is what I'll explain. Uh, actually, before I'll, I'll explain this and then I'll explain that. So this is just to illustrate this concept that we um, have of charm pressure uh, score. So imagine we have this community and there is these two people that churn, that leave um, the company. And these are the seats uh, for the churning. And then we look at the influence area of these people, which would be these, these ones here, which are the people that have been in contact with the ones that have left. And then we just build predictors on what is the probability that each of these people has uh, in, in uh, leaving the company. And then we assign a weight to, if, to each of the people. And then we say, well, this person has a 90% probability of leaving the company. So if the marketing team then asks us, uh, you know, who are the people that are most likely to leave? We can provide this information and they, they can offer them uh, special offers or they treat them preferentially to prevent them from leaving the company. Um, as I mentioned, we uh, quantify the influence that a person has uh, with two variables. The first one is the actual influence which is um, the influence that each person exerts on the other person, and that will be this probability that I have shown before. But we also mm, assign a monetary value, because not all customers are equally valuable from a monetary perspective. It's not the same if a person spends 100 euros a month versus a person that spends 10 euros a month. So we also attribute uh, a monetary sort of like influence that a person has. If it is a community where there is one person that maybe only has 50% chances of leaving, but the monetary value for that person is 500 euros, maybe it's more important to target that person than another person that only um, has a monetary value of 10 uh, euros. So it's, uh, when you go into real life, there's all these factors to take into account that make, make it a little bit complicated. Um, so I just wanted to illustrate here um, sort of like the, the benefit that we can get when we add this uh, vital uh, churning. And something interesting is that um, it is much cheaper, and this is important, this is why companies care about churning, it is much cheaper from many perspectives, not just monetary, but also in terms of customer satisfaction. It's much more beneficial to keep a customer than to recruit a new customer. So it's much more important to any company to have their customers happy and loyal and engaged than to be recruiting new people because the, the learning curve and the cost of recruiting people is much larger than the cost of keeping people happy. That's why churn is a very important concept uh, in, in any company. This is actually that we have in operation and it's run weekly and then the results are being shared with the marketing teams because this, is, this all concerns the marketing teams. Another um, type of work that we do uh, using communities is profiling people. And this is all related to the concept of homophily, which I think most of you are familiar with. Uh, basically, homophily means that people tend to have sort of like friends, uh, as friends, people that are similar to them. And there are two sort of like sociological explanations for this. The first one is the, um, the uh, social influence phenomenon. So when you are in a social setting, you are influenced by the rest of the people, and that uh, so like makes you imitate the behavior of the people that you interact with. And the second um, process is called selection, uh, which means that we also choose who are our friends. And we tend to choose people that are similar to us. And uh, this is a phenomenon that has been well known since the beginning of uh, times. So Aristotle already was saying people love those who are like themselves or Plato and similarity uh, that gets friendship. But probably all of you have heard uh, the birds of the feather flock together sentence, which captures this, uh, this concept of homophily. So what have we used homophily for? So we've used for a couple of things. The first one is to uh, infer the socioeconomic level of people. Um, so we, we don't have information, complete information for all our customers, obviously. And in fact, uh, in Latin America, 95% of our customers uh, don't provide any information to us because are prepaid customers. 
which means for 95% of our customers, we don't know anything except for their behavior. So all these inference algorithms are extremely important because there is really no information uh, about the people. So um, in the case of this particular project, what we want to do is to infer the socioeconomic status of people in a social network, given that we only know the socioeconomic status of some people uh, in the network. And we just apply um, uh, homophily and the, the community detection uh, algorithm, and we are able to predict with about 90% accuracy the socioeconomic uh, um, levels of, of the community, of the entire community as a group. Uh, we've also used this for uh, handset prediction. So there is an influence on the type of handset that you have. Uh, you influence your friends and your friends influence you in the type of answers that you have. So, for example, uh, if an individual has uh, this particular model of uh, phone, it's 17 times more likely than their friends are going to have one of them. So this is very valuable information, obviously, uh, uh, for any company. Um, there is also another interesting homophily phenomenon between BlackBerry and the services, and the BlackBerry and the services that people use. So if one friend has a BlackBerry, 17 times more likely the other friend has a BlackBerry. That's what I said before. And if two close friends have a BlackBerry, you have 50 times more chances than not to have a BlackBerry. Um, if we look on the services that people use, we also have a similar behavior. So we can multiply by five if you have a close friend that uses a particular service. And you can multiply by 31 if you have five friends that use a particular service. So this is very, very interesting uh, results uh, that I think is indicative also of sort of like human behavior. Uh, another area that we're working on related to social network analysis is customer acquisition. So customer acquisition means how do we uh, target new people, people that are not our customers. Um, so something that um, we observe is uh, we not only observe the behavior of our customers, but when our customers call non-customers or the other way around, there is a record also in the CDRs. So when this person calls this person that is not a Telefonica customer, we do get a record, even though we don't know anything about the, this person, but we see that there is uh, a person there you know, that is being called to. Um, so what we can do is um, build the social network and build the communities, even if it is with non-customers, and then try to identify the most likely known customers that would, would have a propensity to become customers because of the type of social relationship that they have with our customers. We think that, that because of the uh, influence of these customers and the phenomenon of homophily and social pressure, they will be good candidates to become uh, new customers. And that's one of the strategies that is being used to identify potential customers. When we do that, um, we are able to increase the, the performance in terms of targeting potential uh, customers 20, 28 times when compared to not looking into the social uh, influence uh, parameters. And this is a very big improvement. Another interesting project that we do with the social networks is fingerprinting. And this is, there is this con there's a concept called spinners. Have you heard of that? Uh, okay, so churners are the people that leave the company and spinners are people that leave and come back immediately because there is a better offer. Um, so, they, so the people that are constantly looking for the offers and then they leave a company and then they, they, they join a different offer and then they come back and then they go somewhere else and then they come back again and so forth and they're always chasing the, the offers. And the problem is that there is no persistence because they change their number, the phone number, even though it's the same individual, there is no persistence in our databases saying that this is the same individual because it's a different phone number and maybe that's the only information that we have about the people. So what we do is we, we create a fingerprint of each people as characterized by their social network. And I'm just going to illustrate this with this example. So say we have this social network right now, uh, and this is the, the spinner um, customer. And then this person leaves, disappears from our you know, entries. That person is gone. That phone number doesn't exist anymore. But then we have a new customer here that happens to have the same social structure as this one here, but it's a different number because it joins again. Um, so because of using these fingerprinting uh, algorithms, we are able to realize that there is a very high probability that this guy is the same as this guy because he has the same social interactions as the other person, uh, unless it is like a clone of that person. So we are able to um, assign 
pro uh, probabilities to, the, uh, to people thinking if they are spinners or not. And this is very important because, as I said, we want to characterize people as, as, as good as we can. And if we already had you know, inferred uh, information about this person, uh, we can attribute that information to this, uh, to this other node. Um, we are also working on household identification. I'm not going to go into the details, but this is uh, actually a, a pretty interesting uh, problem as well, which is to identify all the phone numbers, landline and mobile, that belong to the same household. So in this case, the community would be the family that is living under the same household. And by combining not only the social network information, but also the mobility information, we're able to do this. This is very important with prepaid customers and with a lot of households where there is only mobile phones, there is no landline phones. For example, in Latin America, there is many, many households where they don't have a landline phone, so we really have no information about them. And finally, you know, we, we can also relate it to the community identification uh, problem. You know, we can label uh, relationships into personal, professional, etc., with pretty high accuracy. Now we're going to go into, into mobility. So, as I mentioned, the CDRs not only have the colli and the cold and the duration of the call and so forth, which is what I have been explaining until now, but it also has the cell tower that the person is connected to. And by using that piece of information, we can infer some aspects about the mobility of people. Um, I don't have a lot of time, so I'll just try to uh, focus on the most important things. So we do multiple things here. We do analysis at the individual level and also at the aggregate level. Uh, at the individual level, the first thing we do is that we look at the communication patterns over uh, a long time period. And we always split, and this is very important for any behavioral analysis, always splitting Monday through Thursday. Friday could be the same or could be as a separate uh, variable, and then Saturday and Sunday. Never mix weekends with weekdays. People behave completely different weekdays versus weekends. Um, so this would be sort of like the signature of a particular um, customer in terms of the pattern of calls during the week and during the, week, during the weekend. And what we do is we create that for all the customers, and this is sort of like our representation. This is our input to our algorithm, and then we cluster them. And then we find very interesting clusters on different behaviors that people have. So for example, this cluster would represent people that are pretty much calling all the time. Weekdays, weekends, they have a pretty homogeneous pattern of calling. They're only, they're only not calling when they are sleeping. Um, these other people, however, talk more in the evening than during the day. These people talk much more in the weekends than during the week. And these people, for example, talk only during the week. So this is probably a professional phone, a phone that's used for business. So, you know, we can do that for all the people and cluster and find maybe 10 clusters of 10 different behaviors and that allows us to segment people by their behavior, by the type of uh, calling patterns that they have. And then because we have the location, we can also identify relevant locations for each person. And then we also do this uh, pattern um, clustering on the cell towers themselves. So we look at each cell tower and we look at all the phone calls that are happening in that cell tower over a certain time period, and we aggregate that. And again, we split it between weekdays and weekends, and for a particular cell tower, this could be the pattern of behavior. So in the, weekend, in the weekdays it has this behavior, and in the weekends it has this behavior. And then we apply clustering algorithms on these signals, and then we obtain a certain number of clusters that, this is just an example, we, have, we obtain more, but this is just an illustrative example, that characterize the behavior of the different parts of the city. So this is, for example, the behavior of industrial parks and offices. There is a lot of activity during the weekdays, and there's almost nothing in weekends. This would be commercial areas, uh, because they have activity during the opening times of like uh, commerces and businesses. This would be nightlife, because it has, sorry about this. Um, um, it has a lot of activity in the weekends, um, et cetera. So we can already, um, and this is really actually fairly interesting, because we can um, segment the city, not by neighborhoods, which is the traditional way that cities have been segmented, but by behavior. And automatically identify the areas that are leisure, the areas that are nightlife areas, the areas that are commercial, residential, etc. And of course, this might change over time. For example, nightlife areas are not always the same. And because we have this data and we can do this analysis you know, every month or whatever, you can start also looking at the dynamics of the changes of the behavior. And then what we do is we combine both things. So we combine the behavior of people with the behavior of the areas that, we, that they are in. And then we are able to better understand 
you know, what is the meaning of this area and what do people do there? For example, here we find that the behavior of this person uh, was, um, when he was in this area, was similar to what we think is leisure and nightlife. And it turns out that when doing the um, segmentation of the space, we also find that this corresponds to a leisure um, area. So there is a matching between the behavior of the person and the behavior of the, of the, of the, cell, of the aggregated behavior of the cell tower there. And we can do that for the different behaviors. And because, and be, and because we can do that, we can um, have a better idea of the points of interest or what are the relevant points of interest for the different uses and for the different locations. So if this is leisure and nightlife, probably this would be bars and restaurants and so forth. You know, if this is office buildings, maybe you wanna point them at like banks or ATMs or uh, et cetera. We're also working on characterizing the area of activity of people. I'm not gonna go into the details because he just told me I have five minutes, but these are two very important concepts, which is the concept of area of influence and radius of gyration. Um, so the area of influence is basically the area where people spend most of the time. And there's been a very famous nature paper a couple of years ago by Marta Gonzalez and Laszlo Barabas's lab, I don't know if you're familiar with it, where they, 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 it was in the headlines of everywhere, and it, it was talking about how human behavior is predictable from the perspective of mobility. And they were talking about um, how this area of influence is fairly small for most people. So we can do these types of analysis and understand not only how people call and where they are, but also where do they spend most of the time, them and also their social network. And all these studies, we can also do them at the aggregated level. And this is relevant for, as I mentioned, sort of like the smart cities concept. So aggregated mobility matrices for an entire city, understanding commuting patterns uh, when people move from one part of the city to another part of the city, uh, et cetera. For everything, for any spatial temporal sort of like time series analysis, of course, two variables that are very important is the time granularity and the spatial granularity. So all, this, all the analysis, you can do them you know, with different spatial granularities and also with different temporal granularities. You could do it every week, you could do it every month, you could do it every season, uh, etc. And very quickly, uh, I'll just uh, present the last two areas. The first one is inferring the socioeconomic levels of people from their behavior. And um, this is very relevant in Latin America because there is very uh, well-defined socioeconomic levels and the, the, the differences uh, in income in the different socioeconomic levels are very big. So what people can afford and the type of life that they have in different socioeconomic levels is very different. But we have no information, as I mentioned, about any of these people because all of them are prepaid customers. So what we did in this project is see if just by looking at the behavior of people, in particular the CDR information, which um, as I already mentioned, you can have purely consumption variables like the, the duration of the phone calls, the amount of money that you spend, the type of handset, etc. social variables, and then mobility variables. So if combining all these variables, we are able to infer the socioeconomic status. The socioeconomic status, uh, if you are not familiar with it, is usually defined by a pyramid from A to D. So it's A, B, C, D, uh, sometimes E as well. Uh, and then there is a well-defined uh, range of income for each of the levels in the pyramid. Uh, so the, uh, the study that we did was in a city in Latin America that had three types of socioeconomic levels, A, B, and C, and this is the, the um, ranges of income from a zero to a hundred that for the people that belong to each of the socioeconomic levels. So the way this is done today is by uh, data collected with the National Statistical Institutes in every country, and this is a very slow process, very expensive process, and it's a process that they only do every five to ten years. So there is a, a big opportunity for technology to have an impact here because we could be doing this every month or, or, you know, or every day even uh, in a much cheaper way. So one of the first problems, well, the first problem that we have to solve with this uh, project is uh, figuring out the home location of people. Because basically the way you attribute a socioeconomic level to people is to say they live here and according to the census information, the socioeconomic level of this neighborhood is this. So the first problem is figuring out the home location. To do that, we used uh, generic algorithms and we had very high accuracy in figuring out the home location of people. Once we have the home location of people, this is the segmentation as given by the uh, National uh, Institute. This is the segmentation given by our cell towers. And as you see, they don't, they don't match. So we have to do some weighted sort of like attribution um, 
of the sort of like the the cell tower versus the socioeconomic levels so we can you know make them match it's not a, a big deal but it's something to take into account so at the end of this um, process what we have is the cell towers and for each cell tower we have a socioeconomic level and then we have all the uh, cell phone usage variables that I mentioned before and the challenge here is to say well as training data we uh, we have a few people that we know the socioeconomic level and then the rest we don't know anything and we have to build a model that is able to play the socioeconomic level um, so we did a number of algorithms for future uh, selection uh, we selected sort of like what are the top features because we usually have around 400 variables uh, as input variables which is too many so we always have to do future selection and then we tried with different classifiers from uh, support vector machines or random forests and they all reach our, around 80 percent accuracy in predicting the socioeconomic level this project in particular uh, received a lot of attention from uh, from united nations and we are actually looking into collaborating with them there is an initiative called global pulse and there is this concept of data philanthropy where the idea is to use this pervasive data that is everywhere and that so many companies have and public institutions for social good so and in fact predicting the socioeconomic level is one of the problems that the United Nations has and in particular they are very interested in understanding the impact that the price of food has in human behavior and condition to the socioeconomic level that people have so if we can predict the socioeconomic level and we also can have a lot of information about the behavior of people because we see how people move we see the type of phone calls they make etc uh, we correlate that with the uh, price of food we can start providing invaluable information to the United Nations on what is the real impact that raising you know the, the price of bread by one cent has in real people this is one of the examples of, of the problems that they're interested in another project that we have done that I'm not going to be talking about here is a study on the uh, propagation of the H1N1 flu in Mexico so we were lucky to have data from Mexico and we um, created um, uh, disease propagation model that includes human mobility real human mobility as inferred from the mobile data um, and my last project in my last minute uh, is uh, psychographics so the goal of this project is to see if we can infer the personality of people from their behavior and how do you characterize personality I don't know if you're familiar with this but there is a very famous and well adopted model called the big five model where uh, the personality of people is characterized as a point in a five dimensional space and these are the five dimensions which I think you probably have heard of so openness so how curious people are versus how kind of like conservative conscientiousness how organized versus not very organized extroversion agreeableness and neuroticism so this is a well-known taxonomy that is being used by psychologists to assess people's personality and what we were interested in was saying well can you infer if a person is extroverted or not or is uh, curious or not just from the way they use their their mobile phone from how they move from you know the the, the size of the social network uh, etc so in order to do that of course one of the first challenges is the ground truth we never ask the personalities of customers when you want to become a customer of Telefonica obviously so how do you actually have ground truth so this so the, uh, what we had to do was to collect it so we did a, a study uh, actually let me just skip through this um, so we did a, a, a large-scale user, user study we recruited about 700 people and these 700 people and it was very well taken care of they were of a certain age ranges they all had to ha be, had been telephonica customers for at least six months because we needed the data and um, they were all 50% from a metropolitan area 50% from a non-metropolitan area and 50% men 50% females and what they did was um, they both filled out a standard personality questionnaire like the one that all psychologists use to assess personality that's considered the golden standard and they gave us access to their call detail records and we used that as our training set and then the goal is to, to, to see if by extract you know sort of like if we can predict personality basically from the data that we observe from the call detail records and the answer is that you know we had pretty good results uh, I'll go into the classification results uh, we tried with different algorithms we obtained similar results uh, out of the 400 something variables we did feature selection again 20 variables and we got about 87 or up uh, uh, classification results uh, so just to conclude um, basically I just want to say that you know 
uh, this is an industry in telecommunications that maybe you haven't heard of because you've all heard of Facebook or Google, but maybe not so much about a telecommunications company. But you know, we have a lot of data, uh, very challenging uh, problems and real life problems that you know we are working on, and there is a lot of machine learning problems to deal with. And I'll just finish by saying that uh, this that we are hiring. So if any of you is interested in any of this, send me an email and uh, thank you for your attention. If there is, do you mean if there is a new subscriber? No, when you have a community finding in the network, and if, if the network, if the operator has uh, a million or three million subscribers, does your algorithm need to be able to find a set of subscribers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 When, when you do, um, are you introducing what overlapping communities that allow overlapping communities? Yeah, yeah. We, we, well, no, no, no. Well, we allow people to belong to, the, to multiple communities. So one person can belong to multiple communities, but they are not overlapping. Yeah. So it could be the work community, and then you could belong to a, a family community. But I mean, it could be the case. Um, I can't see you with the. Um, so one person can belong to multiple communities, but the communities themselves, like the rest of the people in the community, I don't think they are overlapping. Thank you.